Welcome back, everybody. Um, we are now uh, starting the next part of this uh, webinar, which is to look at what the regulator um, is, has already seen, the feedback that the regulator has already received. And the regulator, of course, in this case here in the European Union, that would be EASA. And that's why we have the colleagues uh, here in Cologne at the EASA headquarters uh, from the different domains from uh, the domain of ATM, from the domain of aerodromes, and from the domain of air operations, who are going to share with us their experience um, of GRF implementation. So I would now like to hand the floor to Augustin Klus, who is uh, an ATM, a senior ATM ANUS expert. And uh, the floor is yours, Augustine, to share with us what is the ATM perspective on the introduction of the global reporting format. Thank you. So, good morning, everyone. So, uh, thank you, Julia, for my introduction. So, uh, we have prepared a few slides addressing the ATM perspective, you know, as a first uh, feedback to you from the regulatory experience. So we will try to look in the back a little bit, but also we will try to present you what uh, are the next regulatory developments which we would like to enhance currently regarding the, the GRA. So uh, we have started with, uh, with some regulatory development. Uh, as you know, we have the main regulatory framework, which is called 373. 2017, and initially we tried to address uh, the AIS aspects, you know, and particularly the SNOTAM format and instructions. So, however, in parallel, uh, we have also realized there are other, let's say, put it in the brackets, inconsistencies. So, and basically the incon inconsistencies were between the PANS AIM, uh, PANS uh, Airdrome, and uh, linked with the SNOTAM despite the operational need. Also, from the ICAO perspective, you know, uh, regarding PANS AIM and GRF related ICAO annexes, you know, AIP structure and all these elements, you know, we have tried to capture with this, um, with this amendment. So then we have also faced at the beginning excessive SNOTAM origination. So we have tried to address also this. And uh, also, as already addressed in uh, Slido aspect, and we tried to answer already some questions, uh, Annex 11 and PANS ATM, and particularly the specific ter terminology when uh, some ITO provisions are still referring to the breaking actions, which we believe needs to be modified. So, In order to address this, you know, we have been thinking how to best approach and quickly inform the ATM and other airspace user uh, um, by the tools we have in house. And so basically, in order to address the IP contact, we have issued the SIB in 2021. You know, we have followed the SIB on 80s use, you know. So, in order to, to, to try to address the inconsistency between the Annex 11 and PANS ATM, and finally, the SNOTAM. So, there were three SIBs in order to capture the operational need from the initial perspective. Uh, so, we have also further proposed the amendment when it comes to the AIP content. I will not read uh, the, the proposal, but you can see it in the, in the slide. So, when we have tried to address the AIP section, it's 81.2, 81.2.2, and 82.7, and so on. So, in parallel, uh, due, during the NPA, 2022-04, we also tried to address some elements of APIs and exchange of error reports. So there is a, as we explained in uh, some slide of question, there is still need to further somehow address the 80s messages as we 
see in the Slido, several of you commented about the length of the APIs and also uh, my, uh, some presenters here from, uh, from, uh, from the morning session also explain that the length of the APIs might be still some issue. So here the question is, uh, we have to be careful because for me, the important information is uh, that the artist includes the necessary information. So sometimes it might be lent, you know, but it's important from operational perspective that the information is reached to the appropriate uh, uh, audience or airspace users. So uh, just one example here, uh, which is linked to the artist, while we have been uh, receiving a number of queries by the member state or particular uh, service providers. And here is one example where we have said that it's possible to shorten uh, the communication, provided that, that, that this is arranged with the appropriate uh, competent authority. And in this case, we have been positive to saying uh, that, yeah, you can you can use only uh, runway condition report and the other elements only on the request if this is arranged appropriately. So this was one of the aspects when we have tried to address. Uh, the next, the future. So we have also reviewed the ATS rule and we have come to the number of uh, bullet points here when uh, there is a need to further enhance um, the current uh, regulatory provisions. So I will not read them, but you can see there are a number of AMCs and GM where we should somehow enhance uh, the current wording. Let's put it in this way. Uh, where we are with this, we have consulted our OPS and airdrop colleagues on the proposal. So basically, we have received feedback from them, which was positive, and then now we need to further finish the rulemaking procedure. So we are also aware of other issue, and uh, it was already highlighted in the Slido. It's item 10 of the snow time. So we are progressing in this area as well. Uh, so impact on not updated RCR by airdrop operators. So here we don't see a need to rule a review, but uh, uh, let's see. Uh, and as mentioned, uh, clarity regarding uh, or clarity regarding to the applicability of ATM and GRF related rules, considering the scope of the airdrop and air ops rules, you know. Uh, from our perspective, the conclusion, uh, we have tried to provide the implementation support uh, following the holistic approach. So uh, we have seen the challenges both in the AIF part and ATS domain part from the GRF perspective. Uh, so we have tried to address uh, the issue at the regulatory level. So uh, we have also tried to communicate with ICAO some, some areas for improvement, you know. And uh, as I mentioned before, we see some regulatory changes envisaged in order to close the loop from the ATM perspective and address all the necessary aspects, you know. Uh, as we mentioned, some uh, issues cannot be only dealt at the EU regulatory level. So, and then we would like to seek some close cooperation with all actors at the state level and uh, in order to ensure the, the proper implementation. Uh, but uh, my understanding from the presentation this morning was that uh, uh, from the other domain, because we haven't got any speaker which would re really represent ATM ANS, um, the positive aspect of the GRF concept as, as such. So that's all from our side. Thank you for your attention, and uh, I'll hand over to my next colleague.
Thank you very much, Augustine, for explaining us the, that you are already in the phase of having analyzed those parts of the ATMA NEST regulatory framework where you see that it, there might have to be some amendments. And I also saw that in your slide that you mentioned some of the rule re references you made uh, have come up actually in some of the questions uh, on Slido. So that's good, good to see that uh, EASA is already working on something um, that uh, also the audience here uh, sees uh, is important. So uh, just before I hand uh, the floor to the next speaker, I would like to remind you all, um, we have 440 something participants in this webinar and you should all have access to Slido. I see that the most popular question right now has uh, attracted some some 20 thumbs up uh, votes. It would be good that you, uh, before we go into the open forum and to, where we will select the most popular question, that you still take a look at Slido and pick your most interesting questions so we can really address those questions where most of you, uh, most of the 440 participants find them to be really interesting. So uh, just a kind reminder that you use Slido before we go into the open forum. I would now like to hand the floor to my colleague Giorgio Cascone, who's uh, an aerodromes expert uh, at EASA, and he will report on a survey that we have done with all the competent authorities in Europe on how they have implemented the GRF and the challenges that they have faced. So, Giorgio, the floor is yours. Thank you, Julia, and good morning, everybody. Uh, in the next few minutes, I'm going to give you an overview of this uh, survey that we conducted as EASA. They are the new national GRF, but uh, first of all, I, let me say that GRF implementation was a, a challenge for all the concerned stakeholders, uh, also because it implied um, a cross domain effort uh, in terms of coordination between different domains. And from the competent authority uh, point of view, uh, it was uh, uh, even uh, more complex because, uh, apart from very uh, cross-domain approach, uh, it also required uh, a lot of uh, implementation activities, um, like, for example, a promotion and support activities, like meetings, webinars, and in some cases also trials, uh, training of personnel, update of the oversight programs and the related implementation and also assessment of the changes proposed by the uh, operators and providers. And last but not least, update of the aeronautical information uh, required to be published by the state. There are some uh, people in the chat, um, Giorgio, saying that they have difficulties hearing you. So we have moved the microphone closer okay. to you. Um, and maybe you can speak up a little bit uh, because we have now uh, six or seven chats telling us they have difficulties to hear you. So I can't move the mm. audio any closer, but I think okay, this yeah. is as close Sorry? as it can get. Okay. Yeah. Sorry for that. I didn't realize. Um, okay. So uh, I was uh, just introducing this presentation um, saying that um, GRF implementation was a challenge for all the concerned stakeholders. And from, in particular, from the authorities perspective, it was uh, uh, even more complicated because uh, um, apart from dealing with different domains, so with a, with a, a cross domain approach, they also had to implement many activities in order to implement GRF. And so uh, as we were aware of this complexity of GRF, GRF implementation, uh, in September 2022, as Erdom section, we, we launched this survey uh, in order to collect information from the member states um, about the implementation of GRF uh, in the uh, field of aerodromes. Um, we received a reply from all, all, all the member states, uh, which gave us a, a complete overview of the state of the art of the implementation of GRF. Uh, in a nutshell, we could say that uh, uh, the, out the outcome of this survey was uh, very, very positive uh, because, first of all, um, we found that all the member states uh, uh, achieved to implement GRF uh, by the set uh, deadline. 
um, the majority of the competent authorities uh, uh, reported that consistent implementation of GRF, even if with some challenge that we will see later on. Uh, and in general, we uh, gain a, a very good feedback from the majority of the authorities that uh, participate in this survey. As I told you before, um, the implementation process, uh, the, 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 the competent authorities, uh, not only the competent, but all the involved stakeholders, uh, during the implementation process, they faced uh, different challenges. Uh, that can be summarized as follows. First of all, uh, as I told you before, the effort required by this uh, multi-domain approach, so uh, the, the additional effort required by um, coordination with different st stakeholders. Uh, another important challenge that uh, many authority reported, uh, many authorities reported was uh, training, training of both uh, authorities, personnel, so ergrom inspectors, and also training of aerodrome personnel. Um, also, um, systems and equipment, uh, how it was mentioned before during one of the previous presentations was a challenge because of the lack of uh, um, reliable systems and tools for runway condition assessment. Um, time, for, time frame for implementation was also a challenge because it was uh, uh, shorter than uh, the deadline provided by ICAO. And on top of that, uh, COVID, which uh, obviously uh, made things even more complicated. Uh, however, uh, despite of the, the challenges that I mentioned before, um, the opinion of the competent authorities about the new GRF rules uh, was uh, uh, extremely positive. Um, in fact, more than three quarters of the competent authorities uh, declared themselves satisfied with the new rules, uh, meaning that uh, they don't see any need for clarification or change of the current rules. But we also received some comments uh, from some national competent authorities, about 20% of them, uh, asking for clarif either for clarification or uh, some amendment of the rules. Um, the most relevant and most recurrent comments uh, that we received were mainly related to three topics uh, that you can see on this slide. So, running condition report, SNOTAM format, and tools and equipment. Um, the main comments related to the runway condition report uh, regard the maximum validity of running condition report when this is not issued by a SNOTAM. The excessive amount of information included in the RCR, this is something that we already found in one of the previous presentation from the airports, and uh, integration of the RCR into the 80s. Uh, the main comments related to the SNOTAM format uh, regard the use of NOTAM and SNOTAM for slippery wet runways. So, also many member states required, required uh, further clarification on this point further guidance on the two sections of the SNOTAM and guidance on the cancellation of SNOTAM for dry runways. And this is something that we also probably found in one of the questions in Slido. And last but not least, we also received comments on tools and equipment. Uh, so mainly for uh, regarding tools for water, met water depth measurement or in general for uh, runway condition assessment. And I would like to close this uh, short presentation with just uh, an overview on the implementation uh, of GRF on exempted aerodromes and also uh, other aerodromes uh, out of the scope. Um, this is uh, an important topic for uh, the member states to consider because uh, the airlines are flying there and pilots expect to receive the, the same information. So this is why it is important. Um, regarding implementation uh, of GRF at exempted rooms, uh, we have found a different approach among the member states. But anyway, the most important thing that I want to share with you is that uh, the majority of member states uh, apply GRF also at exempted rooms and at a certain extent also at rooms which are out of the scope, uh, either through the adoption of uh, national regulations or directly by, by direct, directly implementing the IK rules. 
some states uh, recommend the adoption of GRF, and in, we have uh, very few cases, actually just a couple of cases where GRF is not implemented uh, yet for those error blocks. And that's it from my side. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Giorgio, for this interesting update uh, on the survey that we have done uh, on the aerodrome regulation and how the aerodrome regulation has implemented, of course, the GRF. And then we have done the survey with the member states. So we have received feedback from authorities that deal with oversight of aerodromes. And I think it shows uh, very well that none of the topics that you've raised today were not also mentioned by the authorities that we uh, consulted. So I think it's good that we realize that also with this webinar, we don't find new things that we haven't thought of before. But let's see after the webinar, we still have to go and look at all your questions. There might still come up things that we haven't uh, thought about. I would now like to give the floor to Giovanni Chima, who is a senior expert in air operations and who is going to tell us how he sees it from an air operations rules point of view and how uh, he sees it now after almost two years of implementations of the changes that you have made uh, in the area of air operations with regards to the GRF. So Giovanni, the floor is yours. Um, thank you, Julia, and uh, good morning everyone again from Cologne. Uh, I will just conclude with one slide uh, to give you the OPS uh, uh, perspective on the regulatory efforts that were made by EASA to implement the GRF. So we'll ne not take too much of your time. Um, the OPS rules related to the GRF entered into force in August uh, 2021, like the rest of the GRF package, and basically they were introducing three requirements, the first of which was uh, uh, to require uh, a, an assessment of the landing distance at time of arrival based on the runway condition report of the, in the GRF uh, format. Then uh, the use of uh, specific performance data for the time of arrival. And then finally, uh, to close the loop, uh, the requirement uh, for the pilots uh, to report back uh, in case uh, um, the braking action encountered during the landing roll was different uh, from the one expected on the basis of the runway condition report, so that the aerodrome has uh, uh, input to decide whether or not there is a need uh, to reassess the runway surface condition. Um, we started to gather feedback on the implementation of these new rules uh, over the last couple of years, uh, both through uh, questions and direct interactions with stakeholders and member states, and through also standardization inspections in the domain of OPS. And the feedback uh, is generally positive. The system seems to be working. There are, of course, corner cases of, or a specific situation that may require special attention. But overall, uh, the feedback is positive. Uh, the main issue encountered by operators is uh, the availability of uh, uh, performance data for the time of arrival assessment uh, from manufacturers. And this is especially true for uh, all designs or uh, particular cases of aeroplanes where uh, either the manufacturer is no longer in business or the support provided uh, by the current TC holder is uh, limited. In such cases, there could be difficulties because the only uh, possibility that remains is the use of the generic factors that are provided in one of our AMCs, but this may be uh, very conservative in some cases. And uh, another feedback that we have received uh, sometimes is that uh, the reporting format of the GRF is not applied uh, uh, always consistently in all countries and all airports. And this is especially true outside of Europe. Um, so we will continue to uh, gather this feedback and see what improvements we can make and what support we can give to uh, stakeholders to ensure uh, an even better application of uh, these uh, new rules. And that concludes my um, uh, my feedback. I can give the floor back. Thank you. Thank you very much, Giovanni, uh, for giving us the insight into how you see it after almost two years of implementation of the GRF rules from an air operations rules point of view. 
Uh, I don't see that uh, you see that there anything that has to be amended in the OPS regulation, right? Uh, well, there could be some refinements. Maybe a few points have been highlighted in the presentation from Lufthansa earlier today, but I don't see uh, the need for uh, major changes.